Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Syria Security Seminar here at Purdue University. Um, we made it through one more semester, so this is the last talk this semester. And it's my great pleasure to introduce David Pisano uh, from MITRE. And he's going to talk about identity-based uh, internet protocol network. And he has a few other, um, I think, caveats here. The main idea is how to build it on existing equipment. Yeah. All right. well, good afternoon. Um, I'm Dave Pisano. I'm from MITRE. Um, I'm actually a senior network engineer there. I'm also a contributor to the HoneyNet project. Um, so identity-based internet protocol, or also uh, referred to as IBIP for short, um, it's a project I've been working on at MITRE for about two years now. Uh, to sort of go over what this talk's going to cover um, and to give you the um, so sort of the problems and the motivation behind the, the um, this project, um, go over the concepts of IBIP. I'm going to talk about some of the transformational security claims we're making with this and um, go over the results of some testing we've done um, in the lab. Um, so before I start, um, IBIP is still under development. Uh, so details are likely to change um, as things get, impl as get implemented. Uh, and one thing I want to emphasize from, emphasize from the start is that um, IBIP is for uh, enterprise, it's meant for enterprise networks and not the internet. Uh, uh, with the current state of malware, um, it's impossible to prevent it from entering the network. Uh, there are numerous unknown vulnerabilities in software, uh, with the current state of um, browser plugin security um, and with drive-by web attacks, browsers are being compromised on a regular, very, uh, very regular basis. Um, and also, yeah, users will almost always be susceptible to social engineering and having the credentials stolen. Um, given the sophistication of current malware, um, host-based malware detection is a losing proposition. Um, one of the first things that um, some pieces of malware do is disable the, the host-based um, malware detection. And sort of to give you a um, idea of the scale of the problem, um, there's something around 200,000 um, new pieces of malware detected every day. Um, so what is IBIP? Um, IBIP is a new network architecture that leverages the um, existing equipment in your network. Uh, we only need to add one appliance per layer three segment. Um, this device enforces all behavioral and access control policies outside of the host system. Uh, its key features are adding user and host identity into every IP packet while preventing spoofing. Um, we add dynamic role and trust metrics that are used um, as a gating function for access control. Uh, policies can be changed on the fly um, to adapt to the change in threat conditions uh, of the network. Uh, clients are hidden and network infrastructure, both clients and network infrastructure are hidden um, except for uh, authorized users and hosts. Uh, and any attempt to access these will generate an alert. Um, IPIP allows for the creation and enforcement of commercial use policies for network applications. Um, the major benefits uh, to IBIP that is that it um, combines both the user and host identity at the packet le level, um, allows for the network to adapt to changes in the threat conditions, um, creates and enforces commercial use policies um, for the network and network applications, and uh, how and how trustworthy users and hosts are. Um, all of this gives the operator of the network unprecedented, unprecedented situational awareness and the potential for a uh, truly self-defending uh, self -defending network. Um, the objective of actually IBIP was to test some recommendations put forth in a 2010 DARPA study uh, that was performed. Uh, so let me go over the architecture here. Uh, the IBIP um, architectural concept, uh, concept 
involves making operational uh, distinguishations between clients, servers, and infrastructure devices, uh, and between IBIP-enabled uh, endpoints, um, either within a local enclave or um, outside through a gate through a trust gateway. Um, IBIP policies are enforced at each of the edge at each edge point of the network. Um, using uh, COT switches and routers and a MITRE developed uh, IBIP professional, uh, permissible um, enforcement point, or sorry, policy enforcement point, or PEP, um, which serves as the main policy enforcement point and this is where um, uh, we, we foresee this eventually being incorporated into uh, commercial products. Um, we refer to this concept of the, um, the switch PEP router as the IBIP um, edge string. Uh, essentially, each end user um, uh, is connected to the switch, and um, which is then backed. IBIP then backs each one of those uh, by the PEP. Um, most of the IBIP architecture is built using uh, COTS components. Um, we developed the, um, the IBIP PEP, I mentioned earlier, the uh, registration server, and the, um, the network operations console. Um, we're currently developing the uh, trust gateway. Um, the effect of the um, IBIP architecture is that access to the network is based on the user's identity and that of the machines. IP addresses are tied to this identity uh, and switches are configured so that each switch port is restricted to the host and user um, that authenticates, effectively eliminating the ability to um, spoof IPs, uh, IP addresses. Uh, private VLANs are leveraged to maintain separation between hosts on the same subnet um, this combined, um, this combination of incorporating identity into the IP packet and preventing, prevention of spoofing provides uh, accountability of traffic in a way that is simply not possible today. Um, as mentioned previously, uh, clients are hidden in the network and what a client is uh, permitted to access on the network is determined by the user's role and organization. Um, similarly, servers are constrained by policy to provide only uh, those services that are authorized. Uh, if a policy, if policies are violated, the network operation console is informed and depending upon the current threat condition, those violations may uh, result in a uh, out of band um, or out of, sorry, out of policy action um, being permitted or so a permissional state which may appear as at a lower threat condition so things might be allowed or a denial state and when a um, sort of restricted status in the network or higher threat conditions and um, for certain critical assets. Um, the result of this is a, a network that is tailored to the business needs of those using it with significant reduction with specifically reduced threat surface and improved network situational awareness. Let me now, I'm going to go over sort of how the registration process and sort of some of the auto configuration stuff happens. Um, so when a user or host connects to the network, um, they need to get authorized. Um, to do this, we leverage 802.1x on the get switch. Um, so the user connect, the system connects, it provides some type of cryptographically sound um, information. That information gets passed to the switch, the switch passes on to the registration server, which is just a radius, which is uh, running a radius service. Uh, the supplicant on the host will first send some, you know, the hardware certificate information. Um, this will create a um, encrypted tunnel between the host and the registration server. Um, and then some certificates from a smart card or other type of um, 
device will then will then carry the user information across. Uh, if a user is successful in authenticating, uh, this process will then bind the physical port and the switch, the MAC address of the system. Uh, the registration server will auto-configure auto the PEP to bind the MAC address to the IP address of the system. Um, if the host is serving as a server for um, the server, both TCP UD ports uh, usage policy would be pushed um, to only allow those authorized services. Uh, by requiring strong authentication to get onto the network, we're able to get accountability via a um, packet level ID that it, it that is traced back that can be traced back to both the user and the host credentials. Um, uh, through the yeah, and through the MAC to port and the MAC to IP binding, we reduce the likelihood of spoofing and impersonation. Um, with the registration server pushing source port restrictions, uh, it enables uh, centralized or uh, it enables creation and enforcement of policies uh, with a low false alarm rate. Also, this uh, all this together significantly improves the situ situational awareness on the network. Um, so, here's an example of how sort of the permissible use policies um, work, and uh, and the effect that a violation has. Um, so we have a uh, web server here that is approved to run services on TCP ports 80 and 443. Um, any outbound packets coming from these ports are allowed through the PEP. Um, if there's a packet from a port that is not approved, um, like from TCP port 23, um, it will generate a policy violation. This is then sent to the NetApps console uh, with source attribution information. If the uh, number of policy violations exceed a set uh, threshold for either the user or host, uh, trust metrics are then updated and sent to the registration server. Uh, the registration server then tells the PEP to update um, trust metric levels on the server's um, source shim on the ingress to the network, and you have the option of having a uh, trouble ticket generated automatically as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the previous slide is a shim. Um, so this is sort of how IBIP is laid out for our IPv4 implementation. Um, we have we have both this user and host identity that gets inserted into the, each packet. Um, the shim is both is added by um, is both added and removed by the PEPs on each side of the network. Uh, the, sh the shim contains attribution information for those sources, um, source and destination, and, op and optionally the current role and trust levels of those systems. Um, so, given the size of the, the, um, the size of our shim, we, we can support up to about a trillion different uh, different IDs, about um, 32,000 um, organization affiliations, um, 212 roles, and about eight um, trust levels. I'm now going to sort of explain how the shim and actual control is handled. Um, once the user is authenticated, um, policies are pushed to the PEP um, front of them. Uh, this PEP adds shims, um, adds shims to the um, outbound packet, and uh, ingress filter policies are applied. Uh, the packet is then forwarded across the network. On the receiving end, um, the PEP applies egress filtering policies, removes the shim, and then forwards the packet onto its destination. So I'm now going to go start go covering some of the, um, the security benefits of IBIP. Um, so here's just a list of some of the current threats that sort of every network um, network today faces. Um, so 
you've got the typical insider threats, um, malware, uh, compromised systems, um, supply chain sh um, threats, um, sort of an anonymous operations, so the ability to impersonate or spoof someone else, um, vulnerable software, slow response time to patches, zero days, human error, um, and plot. And so um, this is this is what I've passed to bring to the table to help help either reduce or address some of those uh, threats and vulnerabilities. Um, I think allows for uh, the policy to say that what should be permitted and by whom, uh, even potentially by when, when and from what system. Um, uh, I have um, provides attribution accountability at the network layer, um, and this is down to both the user and host. And by making identity um, spoofing very difficult and failure failure attempts visible. Uh, this increases confidence in um, your information. Uh, by making clients and infrastructure devices inaccept, uh, inaccessible, uh, this reduces the threat surface of your, of your network. Um, IBIP sort of establishes policy monitoring and enforcement external to the host. Um, this separates the protection um, from the host so that malicious exploits that overrun the device uh, do not also overrun your network protection. Um, IBIP establishes a mechanism to dynamically adjust both roles and privileges of the user, um, user and host, in response to triggered events. Uh, IBIP supports the concept of dynamic trust metrics. Uh, this can be leveraged as an additional discriminator in determining whether access to a highly sensitive uh, material system uh, should be granted to a particular user and host under different threat conditions. Uh, IBIP permit, uh, permits significantly enhanced situational understanding both in real time and historically. Uh, this is enabled with the ability to do database searches of for under the radar activity but still have the information to attribute the stuff back to the host and user identity of the system at the time that activity happened. Um, and this is accomplished because the identity information remains with the packet and you do not need to depend upon log files for this identity information which might have been rolled over or removed or deleted months or years ago. And so I've made some pretty bold claims here and it doesn't really mean anything unless we actually test this out. Um, so to test these, concept, these com concepts um, we uh, had a, a penetration testing team come in. Um, prior to them coming in, they were fully briefed on how IBIP operated. Um, we set up five objectives that they needed to accomplish. Uh, these were to gain access to the network, uh, conduct network, um, network recon, spoof another um, an IP address, gain access to a server leveraging a zero-day exploit or a pre-placed backdoor, and try to um, gain access to a client from a server. The uh, the blue team role in all of this was, to pu was purely passive. Uh, they were not allowed to take any action on what they saw. If the penetration testing team could not accomplish an objective, they were given additional information to allow them to move on to the next objective. So during this, we had four simple policies in place um, that all clients were hidden, infrastructure was inaccessible, each server had a permissible use policy. Um, this was one policy per server, and not a generic policy, um, as in the first two examples or the first two cases. And a minimum trust metric for ingress ingress is um, was established. So we first asked the Pentos team to try to just get on the network. Um, we gave them access to a physical port um, and a. Um, Ethernet, so the MAC address of a uh, valid system. I uh, provided them a hub so they can sit in between a authenticated system and the switch. Um, and we gave them and um, and they tried to use sort of unregistered or stolen credentials, um, or unregistered, stolen, or counterfeit user credentials to try to get on. 
um, they were unsuccessful in, in trying to access the network through, those me through these methods. Uh, next, we sort of, at this point, we gave them valid credentials and full access to the network so that they can now sort of try to conduct recon on the network. Um, we gave them a list of all the IPs and MAC addresses um, used along with a network topology. Um, their objective was to verify the IP addresses of the client machines and any infrastructure designated systems. Um, they also investigated if any uh, eavesdropping was possible on active traffic between clients and servers on the switch. Um, and so they do this, they use sort of basic tools, just MAP, ping, uh, SSH, telnet, and uh, something called the hacker's tool, or the hacker's choice, which was a tool for um, doing things, um, getting additional information out of network traffic on local networks. Um, act, and there was active traffic between both the clients and servers being generated while they were doing all this to try to do the eavesdropping. Um, they were unsuccessful in trying to do, in performing any of these actions, um, and we caught them as they were trying to do scans of clients and infrastructure stuff. <clears throat> um, next, they were asked to try to impersonate another device um, or, or spoof another device that was already authenticated. Um, they first tried to um, send a packet with a fake source address. Uh, next, they were provided with a MAC address and IP address of a validated system that was in use. Um, they also tried this with a hub between the system and the switch. Um, they were trying to impersonate, um, and again, they were unsuccessful in performing any of these or being able to um, achieve any of these objectives. Um, so, sort of next. Um, we asked them to try to access a simulated zero-day vulnerability on a server um, from a fully compromised client. So given the client, fully authenticated, can do anything that a client could do in the network. Um, the target server was registered as a web server and was permitted to use um, ports 80 and 443. A talent server was running on the system and port 23 to simulate a zero-day. Uh, pen testing was provided. Um, username and password for that server. Um, they were also unsuccessful in trying to access that backdoor. Uh, so objective five was sort of they had to repeat the pre repeat the same thing but try to access a client from a server. Um, and they were allowed to install any software they wanted on the on the server they were using. And, but again, they were unable to communicate with a client. Um, over the course of them trying to achieve all these objectives, we were able to, as they were doing it, they were, we were able to find out, we were able to know what they were doing from the NetOps console, from the alerts we were receiving, and recreate it um, without any information from them. Uh, just, so, just sort of summarize and recap. Um, the benefits, and um, so by hiding the um, the client systems, we reduce the um, the threat surface by eliminating, uh, reduce the threat surface by eliminating user by embedding, sorry, embedding uh, user and host identity into every packet, and by preventing spoofing, uh, we enable accountability and trace back of activity. Um, by enabling access control uh, based upon the user's host. Um, both the user and host identity, we enable uh, segmentation and isolation of critical infrastructure. And by enabling permissible use policies for a network application, we are able to get uh, increased situational awareness and understanding uh, what is happening on the network. Um, this is all implemented with minimal human interaction for, for infrastructure configuration. Uh, this leads to reduced chance of human error in uh, any potential configuration changes. Any questions? <laughs> yeah. So, do you have a modified implementation of your uh, uh, TCP IP? Because um, you you drop in a new part in the packet, right. and so that will change the error check. Right. Um, because we we drop it on the egress and then we pull it out on the on the on the on the egress. Um, 
And as the error checking is done on the, head, the end systems, once it reaches the end system, the packet's back to the way it should be. So you do not have any routers in the middle? We do have routers <coughs> in the middle, but the routers don't look at the overall uh, checksums. So they'll look at sort of, the checksums they look at are the, um, the Mac level, le, um, level one. So we, I mean, because you are yeah, we, we stick the, yeah. the header. We stick. We stick between layers um, three and four. Oh. So the routers don't care about four and up. And um, so the follow up was so how how was the system the um, IBIP right? IBIP okay. yeah yeah. How is that system different from having an ALG and let's say um, an edge firewall because um, uh, it looks like it, it does the same thing but the additional advantage that you have is you're tagging every traffic to a user and to a host right. so there are two parts where you have a policy tagging as well as a hardware tagging so right so we're because we're tagging each each packet and we're able to trace that back in the long run that sort of as an added benefit that you don't get out of the existing systems um, yeah some of the policy stuff you can you can do it on an IP and port basis with, with a standard firewall, but you have to put a standard firewall everywhere. Um, uh, but we can do more than just doing it on ports and IPs. We can do we can leverage that identity information and do access control based upon that identity information, the role information, and the organizational information. Uh, and that's just something you can't do with a firewall, at least today. Um, uh, and the, we also force with the private VLANs. We force all the traffic to go through the policy, the, the policy enforcement point. Uh, so if I want to talk to a system that's sitting right next to me, I have to go up to the policy enforcement point and then come back. Yeah, it's not as efficient, but it's sort of a increased security over efficiency. So, do you have any ALGs on the network with, because you know, before the end system, right. because when it's verifying the packet, it might find something odd. No, we, we don't. Yeah, okay. Not at this time, we don't have it. Yeah, and that, that is, yeah, if you start, if you have something in the middle that's actually looking at that information with the shim there, it has to know about that shim for it so, to work. Otherwise, it's just going to see it as, an, as it's, this is an unknown protocol, either depending upon its configuration, drop it or let it pass, and it's not going to look like it. That is something that uh, if something like this gets implemented on an enterprise network, your systems are going to have to be, your systems that sit within the core and doing monitoring will have to be aware of that information exists. And the tag was removed before the the tag was removed before exit. Okay. So yeah, that makes it clear. Yeah. So like if on your border, um, your tag will be removed before you exit the border to the internet. So your your IPSs and stuff and firewalls there won't have a problem. But even like any IPSs in the core, yeah, right now, yeah, you'll have a problem down the road if this yeah, if it, this sort of catches on it and is commercialized and stuff like that. Yeah, it will. Um, those things will have the devices will have to be aware of it. I just have one more before I wind up. Um, so is the inside host tagging it, or is it a device on the network? That it's the device in the network that tags okay. it. So the hosts, we do no tagging on the host whatsoever because um, we don't trust the hosts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? <laughs>